All right. Well, welcome today to another Engaging Virtual Meetings podcast. By the way, for those who are on Facebook and are helping me choose the cover picture for my uh, for my podcast, thank you so much. We got some great feedback. I'll just show a couple things here. Right, uh, there are four of them. And I can tell you that the current leaders are one in three. Uh, we're also actually going to remove the, the word interviews. It's just going to be called the Engaging Virtual Meetings podcast, right? So here's image one. Uh, this is image two, right? This is image three. And this is image four, right? I feel like you're optometrist. Which one do you like better, four or three? That's right, four or three, or is it back to two and one? Two and one. So great comments so far. Uh, one is leading the track. I do think that we're gonna do this. I'm gonna remove the word interviews, and uh, I think we might highlight something on here. But I got a lot of great feedback from people, so I just wanna just give a shout out right now uh, over 54 people gave me feedback or voted on at least one of the covers. And so I just want to let you know that I am listening to you, right? That's part of being engaging is to engage the audience. You also helped me kick, uh, pick my book cover, which I also really, really appreciated that. Speaking of picking, right, uh, I picked this friend up from my good friend Darren Nerlin. And we've actually gotten a chance now to hang out at Training Magazine. And I was uh, honored enough to be invited to his house, where I really got a chance to see where he does his work as a trainer and a facilitator, as well as I got a chance to work with him on one of his programs. Let's bring in the one and only Eric Gerard. Hello, everybody. <laughs> hey, Eric, how are you doing? Excellent. It's a good day here in Polsbo. I know, in Paulsbo. So for those who don't know where Paulsbo here, let's do the easy part. This is Seattle. This is Paulsbo. But you've got to forget, there's a big body of water right here. And so we drove around. You can actually drive underneath, right, uh, through the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Or what we found out is when traffic gets really bad, it's actually faster to take the ferry across. And it was beautiful. Like, right, Eric? So tell me about one of your favorite ferry experiences, right? Because you told me you really like the ferry. Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it because a typical drive from where I live in Polsbo under the under the sound and back up north into Seattle is long and it's tedious and getting through Tacoma is hard and you get to your destination a little worse for wear. Whereas with the ferry, you know, especially if you plan it right so you're not in a rush, you get there a little ahead of time, you drive your car into the ferry, you go upstairs, have a cup of coffee, look out the window. It's great. It's really, really relaxing. And not long ago, a couple of weeks ago, I took a ferry ride and we're cruising along and we're like right in the middle of the sound. And all of a sudden I hear the engines start to, to throttle back. I can hear them turning the engines down and we're all looking around at each other, wondering what's going on. And then the captain comes on and says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we're slowing the boat. We're stopping the boat because there's a pot of orcas I mean, we don't want to disturb them. So we're just going to wait until they swim along. <laughs> and so, you know, if you're interested, they're over on the, the port bow and, you know, please go take a look. So everybody rushed over to that side of the boat. The boat tilted a little bit when all the people went to one side and we saw orcas playing just off the, the port bow of the boat. It was fantastic. So I didn't mind being late at all. That's the magic of the Northwest, right? That when you have a, an orca jam as a traffic jam, right? Nobody cares. Nobody's mad. Nobody's angry, right? Everyone is like... Uh, behold the amazing part of nature and living in a place that is uh, mostly waters and mountains and trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good, good stuff. Highly recommend. Take a day trip. Well, very cool. So Eric, for my friends who don't know you in my community, uh, do us a favor and take a moment, introduce yourself and what you do. Yeah. So I am a learning geek. I'm a learning nerd. Uh, I've been in learning and development over 30 years, and I spent more than 20 of that in management development in Silicon Valley. I've worked for companies like Apple, Applied Materials, Symantec, Nutanix, so some fairly big heavy hitters in the Silicon Valley. Um, and I got into learning and development in the Boy Scouts, so I started teaching kids how to paddle canoes and swim back when I was a, a young teenager and just fell in love with the idea of seeing light bulbs pop over people's heads when they get a concept, when they understand, and they understand how to apply it in their context. So that's what I do. That's what I do. 
Um, my company, Gerard Training Solutions, is all about management development and specifically helping new managers make the transition from being great employees to being great people managers. And I offer 20 programs to help folks do that. Fantastic, right? And you've done some stuff before, Eric. I, I don't want to see if you wanted to share uh, maybe two or three things from maybe your either childhood to mid-range. Here, I'll, I'll share some of mine. People don't know. I was a sponsored amateur skateboarder at one time. Uh, I was actually a lifeguard. And what was the other third thing I can share? Oh, I was actually a pizza delivery guy in college, right? So I don't know if you will have three things maybe you can share from your past. Oh, my goodness. I could I could go on for a while. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I have worked my entire life. So I started out mowing lawns when I was seven or eight and have been working continuously since then. Um, I already mentioned I was in the Boy Scouts. I was an Eagle Scout. And for, for any Boy Scout geeks out there, I'm an Eagle Scout with three palms and was a member of Order of the Arrow. Uh, and was on camp staff running the waterfront for three years. Yeah. So, so did that quite a lot. And uh, I'm the first one in my family to graduate with a graduate degree. I have a master's degree in intercultural communication, and I'm the first one in my family to do that. Oh, wow. Well, applause to that. Uh, okay, so you, you what somewhat recently moved up here. So what uh, prompted either the move and, uh, or getting into this company? Uh, I don't know if they were simultaneous or if they were around the same time. Yeah, they, they pretty much were. So my wife and I had been talking about moving to the Washington for quite some time, years. And she had been communicating with a realtor who was the father of a friend of ours. And so she was chatting and staying in touch. And we were hemming and hawing about what to do, what to do, when to do it, and so on. The pandemic hit. Uh, things came to a, a point at work where I was ready to go. And so we decided, you know what? Today's the day. So we moved up here July of 2020, smack in the middle of things, uh, bought a house. I started my company. She started uh, a, a business where she teaches kids primarily nature studies and how to cook. Um, she got a promotion at her job, and I became a scuba instructor all during the pandemic. So it was all it was it was primarily. Um, you know, just the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley was just too expensive, too crowded. We were never going to be able to afford a house. Um, and we just, we fell backwards into this beautiful place and got super lucky. So um, I would say this was the best move ever. Oh, well, I got the chance to see your place. And there's definitely so many cool advantages with that, especially compared to the Bay Area, right? I'm pretty sure the same amount of area, uh, money in the Bay Area would have bought you a tiny home. A shoebox. It would have bought me a shoebox. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd have to be like two mice with another, like two other mice, right? Inside of this, you know, four mice, a shoebox inside. Of yeah. This. So we're, we're very blessed and very lucky. Uh, we feel very, very grateful to be here. Well, very cool. Well, then uh, let me just check. Were you doing virtual training though before 2020? Then? Oh yeah. I've been doing virtual training, not as long as you, but I started... I can't remember the name of the Microsoft product. It was around 2000 and um, it was, it was clunky is all get out, but we were using a combination of this Microsoft product. I can't remember and Yahoo to, to do virtual trainings where we were bringing in presenters from across the country uh, this is to like teach pre, pre Skype, right? This is before Microsoft bought Skype, right? Yeah. Oh, way before Skype. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been doing this quite a while. Um, but not seriously, not professionally until the pandemic. Um, I started using Zoom quite a lot, I would say, in 2018, 2019. And what did you pick up either from me? I want to know, like, in your early days of whatever this video thing is. Now i got to go think about what, what Microsoft product that could be. Because normally I would know. I was uh, I was hoping you'd, you'd just have it in your databank. There. I, I probably do, but I'm not, I don't have the right. It's a video-based program, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have to think about it. Okay, what did you pick up uh, in those early, early days? Like, like what were like either some uh, top learnings or spectacular failures 
uh, during that time. I'm trying to think of like one of my, like I used WebEx in the early days, like 1999, and we were just lucky to have like 128 pixels mm -hmm. that were moving, but it was like four or five frames per second. Mm -hmm. And it still felt like a miracle at that time. But I just, yeah, I don't know if you have any learnings from the early stages. Yeah. Uh, I remember we had one, one presenter during this boot camp. Uh, who was extremely animated and he's using, you know, one of the circa 2000s webcams, you know, mounted, you know, sitting on top of his CRT monitor and he's gesturing and he's moving around and he's doing all this stuff. And the frame rate was so bad that everybody in the room literally got seasick and we had to turn the, the feed off because he was just, he was making everybody feel ill. Um, so yeah. Was, I feel yeah. like the Star Trek episode, you know, where they have to fake like they're like they like the thing is listing, right? So they do this. Oh man, uh, it was actually... it was it was pretty bad. So I've never forgotten that, you know, like coaching presenters to sit still and to gesture for sure, but you know, take it easy, you know, when it comes to to moving around a lot because with that technology, it couldn't keep up. Um, that was that was the biggest fail. That and using, um, oh, Placeware. That was the name of it, Placeware. Do you remember Placeware? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, I, yeah, look, Google that one. That's, that's ancient history, man. Um, then I remember using a Polycom, um, and I forget the name of the conferencing service, but hosting again another big meeting where we're trying to have people per participate remotely via audio. And one clown, put us on hold and played hold music over the entire meeting. And we had no way to get him out of the meeting. So he hijacked the entire meeting with his high, with his, uh, with his hold music. Okay. Here we go, right. Room. Placeware was the provider of web conferencing software Xerox engineers a spin off from Xerox park was used by HP, Intel, Sun, and PB PBS. Look at that. But it was acquired. Now this is a word I would have remembered. Microsoft office live meeting. Mm. that's what I would remember, right? So that's what it was called after after they, they bought Placeware. But yes, Placeware was the original part. That's funny. Yeah. I was I've actually, the, speaking yeah. of Park, I've been to Park. Oh. That's, that's a neat place. Talk about that. What did, what did you, uh, what well, first one, do you remember kind of when-ish you went there? That, again, would have been early 2000s. Okay, early and, 2000s. Um, yeah. the, the buddy I went to go see was a, was a patent attorney or a patent lawyer for them. Yep. And he kind of showed me around a little bit. And I remember I saw the predecessor to Kindle Paperwhite. They, they were playing with it and experimenting with it. And I saw this stuff and I'm like, huh, I wonder what they're going to use that for. Because the, the displays they were using were for like signs in a, a store to indicate what's on sale. And I'm like, that seems, that seems kind of a silly way to use this. <laughs> and it turns out it it was the predecessor to what everybody uses now when they read a Kindle. Oh, right. Uh, and so what do you remember from seeing Xerox Park, right? Whether it's culture or a feeling, right? Besides seeing really cool new technology. It was, it was just a cool, it was just a cool place. It was just a bunch of really, really smart people walking around having amazing conversations I couldn't follow. <laughs> and I, I, I wasn't there very long, you know, I was a guest. So there were places that I, I obviously couldn't go. Right, right. But um, there was just lying around were like the first mouse um, or. That's cool. Yeah. Or like, you know, there would be an, a, like a little sign explaining this was this was the predecessor to the Internet kind of a thing. And uh, yeah, Park. Park has been very important in all of our lives, whether we know it or not, you know, like there would be no mouse without park. That's right. Um, the internet. I, I remember when I was working at Xerox in Australia, using the predecessor to the internet, it was a Xerox internal product and it was so clunky, but it was, you know, they, they literally use this big fat RG eight cable that they would drill taps into to connect a computer to it. But that was, that was, earth shattering back in the nineties when I was, when I was in Australia, that was, you know, like ethernet was just starting to become a thing. Yes. Um, yeah. So it's just, it's really interesting to think about the stuff that I've, I've seen or witnessed over the past 20, 30 years and where we're at today. Well, that remind me like in college once again, I was uh, the president of ACM, which is the association for computing machinery. 
And we actually arranged a trip to a supercomputer that was within driving distance from UC Santa Barbara. And like one of the things like you kind of see it now on some of these computers, but this is like where like nitrogen cooling was being used because these things ran so hot. Mm -hmm. Right. And they also had a, they had built the whole supercomputer with a cooling system, mm -hmm. right. That routed and went underground and then went outside so it could dissipate the heat. Right. And bring in cold back, you know, something cold back in to reduce the heat with that. And so I thought those were some really unique aspects of previous computing. Like, and now, you know, I just bought a computer, right. Uh, oh, wow. My internet died. Woohoo. Well, let's just check on that right now. I, I can hear and see you fine. Oh, good. Okay. I'm looking on my side, trying to see if I actually have some signal on my other screen. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, no, that not now I bought a recent computer and again, it's got liquid cooling over the CPU and that like a long time ago, that used to be like something crazy and now it's pretty commonplace. So, yeah. Um, I don't think I've been in the presence of a supercomputer, but I've seen massive massive standalone computers like not not something in a rack but something like four or five feet square yep that the you had to position mainframe, right it wasn't a mainframe though it was it was it was an hp product Ooh. it wasn't a mainframe but it had like eight or 16 cores or something like that and you had to position it over a cooling duct in <laughs> your server room and have it blow cool air right up into it <laughs> Oh. crazy stuff and that that computer right now probably is less powerful than than our laptops probably our phone mm -hmm. right that's the amazing part now right your phone is like uh now again i've quoted this stat there are more phones than computers than personal computers now right that's how important the phone is and most phones have more power right than than most uh laptop or at least especially laptops in the past so okay speaking of computing power let's go back to uh, virtual. So now, Eric, especially since you're facilitating courses, right? Uh, what has to happen for you for a virtual meeting to be engaging? As a participant, consuming? Yeah, as a, yeah let's start as a participant on the other side. Yeah, it's, well, there's a couple of things that have to happen. The first is like the the price of entry is the presenter has to have their act together with technology. So They've got to be well lit so that, so you can see them. And you've got to have good audio. Like bad audio is just a non-starter these days. So those two things I would say are are really, really important. And then once once you pass that hurdle, I would say it's got to be, it, it cannot be lecture-based. It cannot be Professor Gerard just talking at the people. That's just a, the death knell. Of an, of an engaging virtual meeting. So I would say there's got to be use of technology like in Zoom, you can use chat, you can use polls, uh, things like that. Asking people to, to, to interact with you and talk with you is really important. Having activities where you're putting people into breakout rooms where they can, they can speak in a small safe space with just three or four folks and then come back and report out if they wish into the larger group. I think those are those are all things that um, are very easy to do today. And a lot of people don't. A lot of people just present their slides and talk for half an hour or an hour. And I, I think that that is a big mistake. So it, you don't have to be a, ge a genius or a wizard at this stuff, but use breakout rooms, use polls, um, talk to people, play some games, enjoy yourself. I think that that's, that's, that's part of what I've, I would say is important. Yeah, I think I'm really with the enjoy yourself, right? If you already are coming with the attitude like I hate virtual, it it will permeate through whether you say the words or not. Right? That and so like I, I actually really do enjoy now virtual more and more, especially after the, these last three years. And like again, my my recent story was I have a 17 minute drive because I had to go to a venue. Uh, for an, uh, for a recent meeting, but I went at four o'clock here in Seattle and it took me an hour and 20. And that was not fun, right? <laughs> that was, every turn I went to had like some new barrier, some new car crash, some new accident, right? So it was constantly changing. And I'm just saying, I, I couldn't get that hour of my life back. And that actually in the end, after I evaluated the meeting, it easily could have been Right, a virtual meeting with somebody walking around with a phone showing me the location, mm -hmm. and uh, 
Yeah, so I think that's one piece. The second piece that I really got onto is that uh, tools, right? Really get productive with the virtual tools that you have. Learn how to really use all the different tools that you have, chat, poll, right? Breakout rooms. These are some of the best tools. Right? Breakout rooms to me is the third most powerful tool on virtual and people don't use them. And I don't understand that, that piece. Out of all the tools you know, in the last three years, which one is your favorite, Eric? Gotta be breakout rooms. Okay. I, lo I love a good breakout room. When, when it's set up correctly and people know what to expect and you've dropped instructions for chat for people who maybe didn't catch it and it's clear you know, what's supposed to happen inside the breakout room and then you debrief it well so people get something from it. That's it. I think, I think that's, that makes breakout rooms super, super powerful, especially for people who, who don't want to or can't speak up in the larger group for whatever reason. You know, let's say you've got a group of 30 or 40 people and you ask for comments. It's pretty rare that you'll find people that want to raise their hand and speak up in front of 39 other strangers. But right. if you put them in a group with two or three other people and give them a chance to get to know each other and then answer a question, they'll come back smiling and laughing and chatting, and they're much more likely to engage in the larger group. Well, and they really got to meet somebody in their class besides just you, right, mm -hmm. Eric, if you're the only one talking. And that is, you know, part of the education is the networking. Like, who am I going to meet? When I meet people in a class, you figure out which ones would I want to spend time after, you know, hours in the class uh, with. And I think that's something that's important. I also like the structure you gave by that. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Nicole Smith, who just said, all right, the debrief is key. So the, all the elements that Eric just said, right, if you are to use breakout rooms, the best strategies are set it up, right, clearly explain what's going on, give some instructions, right, put them inside the breakout room and then come back and debrief it. I mean, other things that you can do too is jump rooms, like if, if just to make sure like the first time to make sure everybody understands what's going on or if you have somebody else to do it. And the second one is, uh, oh, uh, the second one is uh, sometimes too, we've actually trained other people to be those breakout room facilitators. And you can actually train somebody in the class. Like if you have somebody who's returning to the class, right, but wants more experience in this, you know, give them that role. It's a very easy role to teach. And now they become part of the course and they know they're responsible for doing something and now they're more engaged. I also want to give out a shout out to uh, Miss Gale she said, uh, guilty as much as I want to have more activities for the group. I like them to understand the topic theoretically too. So sometimes I just blab away. Uh, she didn't say that, but, but the group wants more practical application is what they want. So Eric, I would love to hear, all right, you're working, I think, with uh, managers right now. What are they asking for? What are some of the most common trends or requests now here in 2023? Um, let, me, let me go back a little bit because I wanted to comment on jumping rooms. Yeah. I used to do that. And every time I showed up in a room, even though I prepped them and told them I was coming, just to check, and I told them to ignore me, I would show up and they would stop talking. <laughs> and so I... I I have gotten to a point where I trust the technology. I trust that it's going to be okay. Uh, and I, I leave them alone and I let them have that safe, that safe space without the, without the professor looking over their shoulder. Um, but I mean, your, your point works well as well. When I had you facilitate my virtual meeting, I appreciated you checking in to make sure that everybody got it. That was helpful. So now to answer the question that you asked rather than the one I wanted to answer. Uh, um, managers are looking for that human connection. And I heard this directly from a participant. I was, I was facilitating a session for a, a startup here in Seattle. And I was going through the content and cruising along. And, you know, we'd gotten to know each other pretty well. So, you know, it was okay to, to talk back and forth. And so I was about halfway through the class and I said, okay, questions, comments, anything that you want to talk about, you know, before we move on to the next section. And the the kind of head guy, like the president or CEO of the of the the company, said, "You know what? I'm really craving human connection. Can you do that? Can you add more human connection to this? Because what I was doing was a flawless job of going through the content, but I wasn't telling enough stories. Yeah. And so I immediately started peppering in more stories, and then I went to uh, and this is I just thought of this. So can I can I plug a product that's not mine? Yeah, sure. 
So this is master story storytelling. Um, Mark Carpenter is a friend of mine. I hung out with him at uh, training, training magazine, uh, the conference. So master storytelling is the book and he's got a class with the same name. So I read the book and then I took the class and it's absolutely transformed the way that I facilitate, whether I'm virtual or in person, where I, I add a lot more stories. I add that human connection because that's just key. I would say critical. Um, in helping people latch on to a learning that's going to stick. So I did find this here too. It turns out there's a website, I believe, associated with this here too, right? This is the same logo. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And talk to me too, because you know, storytelling is right now in one of the classes that we have called uh, Empower Your Next Virtual Meeting right, with no additional technology. That's what's on my trend list right now, is that people are asking, they're, they're burned out on technology, the last three years fried the most people, like a good 80 plus percent of the people. And they said, uh, we're burned out on technology, but we still want more engagement in our meetings. So we went and reverse engineered what, what we felt like was one of the top keynotes. And one of the top eight things came out was storytelling. And, and so say a little bit more, Eric, what do you think is the principles or the core elements of storytelling that I guess humanize or create that that personal touch on the, your training? Yeah. Well, I think for me, the story has to be real. So retelling somebody else's story won't won't work for me. I I can I can do it, but it I think people t can tell when I'm borrowing material. So the, the stories I tell are real, they happen to me or I was involved somehow or I observed the thing happening. Um, then every good story has an introduction to set the scene so people know where you are and what the situation is and what's going on. There's some kind of a conflict where, you know, you bump into something and you've got to overcome it. And then because of the fact that you overcame that conflict, there's a change. And, you know, this, this can be a story you tell in 30 seconds. So this could be a story that you tell in pieces over, over a, a three hour course. So I tend to tell little stories to illustrate a point, but I make sure that they're, they have these three parts to them. And folks usually smile and nod and they, they get it because I've added that human element that before was lacking a little bit in my facilitation. Do so you have a story that you can actually share that like uh, that, that share with a more general audience? Oh my goodness. Here, if you want, I can stall with one too, right? while you think of one. Do, right. do it. Okay, so while they, while he's thinking, Eric's thinking of his story, you know, the story that I have is uh, people were just saying, right now in virtual too, I am uh, watching very carefully the return to in-person because the numbers are moving quite large and obviously uh, many in the virtual field have seen less work. So we're trying to like evaluate what's happening there. But I was speaking at a conference and uh, it was an actually in-person conference. It's a meetings conference too, which, you know, all these people advocate for coming back because that's part of the meetings industry. And uh, so I asked, I said uh, in the audience, how many of you are loving this in-person, you know, re reunion hug fest? And like every hand universally is in the room is like, yeah, we're loving it. Woo and then I said, how many of you were on a virtual meeting, you know, at least once in the last week? And the same 100% hands went up. Right, so that's where I think that that virtual is still here. I'm still pretty convinced that virtual's here. It's party lifestyle. Even if you are working on an in-person event, I think there are multiple meetings leading up to that that you still do virtual, right? And because it's better, faster, efficient, uh, and and a variety of other reasons. So, yeah. So that's why I think virtual is still relevant, right? Yeah. Despite this return to in-person. I, I think it's I think it's very relevant. I th I don't think it's going away ever. You don't want it to go away. You're in Paulsbo. If it goes away, right, your life's going to change. <laughs> I'm going to be doing a lot more driving. <laughs> and that's and right. it's a lot, right? All right. I got it. I got a story. So I actually went back into my master storytelling materials and I have the story I told as kind of my capstone. So um, the, the audience for the story is other training consultants. So if you're a trainer, uh, you'll probably totally resonate with this. And I bet that everybody else will be able to, to resonate with this. So I had started talking with a potential new client several months ago about doing some work together. We met several times and we seemed to like each other, but then they went dark. I reached out a couple of times to follow up, but then I decided to let it sit and I'd come back to them later. 
Have you ever been in a situation like this? I bet you have, John, where you somebody's just gone dark on you. Oh yes, I, yeah. I'll, I'll bring up a lot of, another story later, but yes. Okay. Well, they reset a few weeks ago with a project that needed to move very quickly. I had a couple of conversations with them, and it sounded interesting, but they weren't used to working with contracts. So I sent them my contract, my paper, and we started negotiating a deal. The project would be doing coaching and application sessions for an hour at a time for a fairly low hourly rate, which I conceived as pebbles that I could squeeze in around the big rocks, the bigger, longer, more lucrative projects. The problem was that as our conversations progressed, they started booking more and more of my time in one hour chunks in the middle of the day and the middle of the week, virtually guaranteeing I wouldn't be able to commit to the big rocks I really hoped for. Remember, they weren't offering a very good rate. I was getting irritated and a little alarmed. This was supposed to be a fairly short-term gig with low overhead. But now suddenly I was being pulled into their systems with multiple disorganized meetings and my time was being monopolized. What would you do in this scenario? Oh, geez, right? This is a client you either got to renegotiate or drop, right? <laughs> yep, exactly. Well, as it turned out, while we were negotiating the contract, my biggest and best client approached me and said they were very happy with the work I've been doing and they wanted to expand what I was doing for them. This was the big rock I was looking for. I carefully wrote a very polite, apologetic email to the potential client explaining the situation and letting them know that unfortunately I was unable to move forward. I expected some harsh blowback, but all that happened was my access to their systems was unceremoniously cut off. What would you have done differently? Huh. Um, I mean, you don't have to cut them off, but you, you have to put further restraints on them. All right. Or just saying, you, uh, you know, renegotiate your value somehow so that you again the relationships what's really important right mm -hmm. uh, that's what i would think and so because quite often that little client or that annoying client could become a great big rock client later right as long as you can figure out how to take care of their stuff while you take care of your stuff it's it's a little bit like business self-care right that's what i would potentially say eric yeah absolutely well the moral of this story is to beware of the pebbles that may expand to take all your capacity and hinder your ability to take on the big rocks you're really seeking so that's an example of a story that I wrote for the master storytelling piece. And it includes an intro, a conflict, a change. Notice that I involved you. I asked questions. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. And those are, you know, just the structure and the asking questions and getting people to put themselves in my place. Even if you don't agree with the, the steps that I took, I mean, I think I could have done this better, but now you walk away going, Hmm, what would I do? And there's a little learning there. Well, and the second part, too, is you never know, especially if somebody doesn't say it in the class, though, going, I'm facing this situation right now. Mm -hmm. You think back and you're going, wait, I got this little rock client over here, right, that I haven't dealt with yet. Okay? And so that's the other part I think that that story can also do is it spurs when you have a great story, it spurs somebody to take action on something that they've been meaning to do. It's like, it's like, you know, diet, right? Exercise more and, and eat better. We all know we're supposed to do it, right? And then we don't. <laughs> don't, don't remind me. We were, talk, we were talking about cookies before the show started. Don't, don't, don't remind me. Let me just side note. I got to meet uh, Eric's amazing wife, and she's an amazing cook who teaches online on Zoom. And yes, we're all consuming her chocolate chip cookies uh, in excess, in a good way, in a bad way, in a good way. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should start using the cookies as a way to get an entree into a meeting. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you should use the cookie in a story. Oh. Right? The, the cookie in the story is like the no-brainer, right? Which is like, because everyone can also, I'm pretty sure like 90 plus percent of the world can emphasize with doing something you're not supposed to do, but you did it anyways, because you like mm -hmm. it. Right. And that's like a, a virtual meeting, right? There I, was a plate of cookies just staring at me and I was, I'm on a diet. I'm not supposed to eat them, but I, I just thought a little like half a cookie wouldn't hurt. And before I knew it, the whole plate was gone. Right. And it's, it's like every, I think if you metaphor it to something, I thought like, I don't, I was thinking multitasking. I'm not sure it's, it's quite the right metaphor, but it's pretty close, which is like the cookie is this thing over here. 
right? And next thing you know it, like I'm over here and somebody calls my name and I have to now go, what? I don't know what's going on in this club. I actually had an exec do that once to me too, which is I asked him or her about a question and they came back and they said, I got to apologize. I was multitasking. I didn't know it. But the good part about it was one, they were honest and two, they never checked out again while I was running the meeting because oh. they knew that I could call on anybody at any time about, and it was stuff we were working on, right, in real time. And so I am not a bash to call the highest level. I don't care, right? Like if you want to short, one of the things you can do, I think this is the greatest favor you could do in a virtual meeting is I tell people, it's like, if you pay attention to this meeting, I'll make it shorter. Oh, that's a good reward. Right. You know, assuming that you have the structure to do it. But but if you know, it's like if you just pay attention to this meeting, I promise I will do my best to make it shorter. And and now there's a lot of controversy about the time, like I'll give you 12 minutes of your day back. But I don't know if you want to say that or not. But in the end, nobody has ever complained about a virtual meeting that went shorter. Right. Right. So just end uh, it. Right. So just like do the work and get people to pay attention and end it. Yeah. yeah. I busted an exec. Um, in a live meeting at Apple, I was, Ooh. where was I? I was in, was that in Austin? No, I think I was in Cork. Anyway, I, I busted somebody who wasn't paying attention and I didn't realize they weren't paying attention. I just said, you know, oh, by the way, Anne, what do you think? And Anne went, what? And it was funny because she was known for multitasking and checking out of meetings and so on. So everybody laughed and thought it was hilarious. And they came and high fived me for busting her. Um, but it could have, that could have been bad. Yeah. You know, there's the balance between all the things that we do. Although I don't know if you find this, Eric, right? We, we talked about um, what you said, professorism. Professorism is when you walk into a breakout room and everyone shuts up despite you having an open door policy, right? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to be open. I'm trying to be authentic. Talk whenever you want. And people, this you can't control how people react to you when you're in the position of professor, facilitator, you know, trainer, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm trying to think, what do you, uh, are you, I mean, if you probably are, how aware are you of your position, like when you're running a class and what are some things that, you can use that to your advantage. Well, what I found overwhelmingly is that people give me and other facilitators a lot of credit off the top of, you know, off the bat. You know, because I'm the person standing in front of the room, because I'm the person who's the host of the meeting. Yes. Um, I think that that people will assign me a lot of, credit and trust and faith just because I'm the one running the thing. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I tend, I tend not to use my power for evil. Uh, I, I actually, I, I remember it. I remember when I was working for Xerox, Xerox in Australia, I was, um, an instructional designer working on a project and I was one of the younger people. I think I was the youngest person in this meeting. And the consultant, the external consultant looked at me and said, Eric, would you get me a cup of coffee? And I'm American. We don't, we don't do that. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, beg your pardon. Would you just get me a cup of coffee? I'd be happy to show you where it is. No, no. I want you to get me a cup of coffee, cream and sugar, please. And she was not backing down. She was making it clear that she was the alpha in that room. And I needed to go fetch her a cup of coffee. I, will never, ever, have never, will never do anything ever remotely like that with my position as facilitator. If anything, nice. you know, I'm just, I'm about, look, I'm friendly, I'm approachable. Um, I do, in fact, know what I'm doing. You know, like you're in good hands with me. That's, that's what I try to portray when I'm facilitating a, a session is that you're in good hands. I know where we're going. I have a plan. I'm going to get us from point A to point B, and you're going to get something valuable out of this. So I'm thinking about you and what you're going to get from this. And we can, um, we can make the process, you know, unique, maybe fun, maybe enjoyable, right? Whatever adjective works for them. Yeah. I, I do my best to get folks smiling and laughing. Yeah. And enjoying themselves. And it, it doesn't have to be a big clown fest. It doesn't have to be ridiculous, but you know, let's relax and enjoy ourselves. So you're going to learn better if you're happy. 
you're going to you're going to have better chance of success of that learning sticking if you associate it with something positive than if you feel like you were you know you couldn't wait to get the heck out of the room because you were so bored or the facilitator or presenter was so pedantic so i just do things that have people kind of perk up and enjoy so again you do you work with you work with executives too as part of your deal right i do i mean primarily primarily newer managers but what a lot of companies will do is they'll say, hey, this is the first time we've offered this mm. to anybody. And we've got people who are directors, senior directors, VPs, who haven't ever had any formal training. Do you mind if they come? And I'm like, no, that'd be great because I'll use them yeah. to tell their stories. Yeah. Yeah. Which are more relevant to the company, right? And to the, to the audience. I think that's really key. What's uh, one thing that you do that, that helps humanize executives, right? Sometimes even the attendees in the class, right? Or, you know, this hierarchy is built into us. So uh, if you do have an exec in the class, especially of uh, lower people, what, what are some of the things that you've seen in the past that have worked to humanize uh, an executive? Well, I think treating them like everybody else is really important. I don't make a big deal of their titles. Um, you know, so if I know I have a director or VP in the room, I'm not going to say, oh, and by the way, today we have John Chen, who's the CEO with us today. It's like, that's what, what good does that do anybody? So instead, I just, I'm going to treat you just like I treat everybody else. I'm going to encourage you to tell your stories and, you know, and, and be yourself, relax. Yep. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, well, let's look at the future now that Eric, right? Uh, you're, you're now in Palsbo. You're working this, right? The world is changing around us. What do you see in the next three to, well, well actually five to 10 years? Let's go out that, that far in that span. What do you see that's going to happen in virtual? Uh, maybe do you have a wish of something you wish would happen in the next five to 10 years in virtual meetings? Wow. Wow. Five to 10 years. I know. Well, you know, the worst part is we have right this this month, March is the coronaversary. This is the three year coronaversary of like coronavirus uh, starting. And you got to go back and like you really have to stop for a minute and think about how much has happened in the last three years. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me think. Ten years ago would have been 2013. I was at Apple. We were using WebEx. I was traveling a lot. I earned 1K. I earned United 1K right around there because um, I was in person doing all these meetings. Um, I think AI, whether it's chat GPT or Bing AI or fill in the blank, I think that's going to absolutely fundamentally change everything, including the way we do virtual meetings. I think we're going to have virtual assistants um, setting up meetings, maybe running virtual meetings. I love what was in a meeting recently, which is like half of the attendees were bots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have my own. I send it to meetings all the time. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So I think, I think bots, uh, you know, AI bots are going to be just ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in 10 years, who is it that's playing around with with brain implants? Is that Elon Musk? Ooh, I cannot confirm nor deny, but I know what you're talking about. Okay, so I think I think that that may get a little more traction. You know, right now today, there's no way I'm putting anything in my head, <laughs> except but for in, stuff we already do, right? Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> these, these, these days, for me, it's just a whole lot of coffee. There's there's a lot of coffee going in there. Um, yeah, I think I think that there's going to be a closer and closer marriage between AI and implants and um and you know Zoom 10.0 where you know we could be virtually in the same space together. Do you remember Second Life back in the day? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I, heard, I heard Second Life is still actually running around and's got stuff going on on it like still. Oh really? Hey, yeah. I I had an account in Second Life and I was going to use it for training. Yeah. It never got off the ground. But way back, the, the first time I was independent, like 2007, 2008, I opened up an, um, a Second Life account because we were going to do virtual training in a virtual space. 
And I could just see how that that happens, um, but a lot better than it was in the 2007, 2008 timeframe. Yeah, I see a, a number of things that are in that space, which is that three dimensionality type of thing one day could make it right. There's the VR pieces. There's also like the avatar, you know, since you're in the management work is a tough piece because like why video conferencing like this is still so important. This is really truly your representation, right? Mm -hmm. And not a computer, right? So, you know, this whole conversation changes like uh, here, we'll do this part. If uh, like I come into the meeting and now I run the whole meeting like this, right? And now you're just like, I don't even know who this guy is, right? So I do think that there is I, I would literally love to see VR if you or if you're going to use an avatar, like to actually have either a very close representation of their face or their actual video of their face. I think that's something that's going to be important for us. For, uh, you know, the best part about this, too, is it's not just technology, right? It's also how do humans use this technology? And what we saw in the last three years is that humans were able to adapt to video conferencing, where most people's opinion prior to 2020 was like, eh, this stuff disconnects us. And now people really found out that they could really connect, right? There are people that have dated, right? Or met only on virtual. Like some of my best friends now, I have never met them in real life. So there's a number of things that allowed us as humans to build deeper connections over these tools than before. Like, I don't, I don't think people were as successful beforehand. So, you know, speaking of the human piece, um, the first chapter of the book that I'm working on is all about empathy and how very important empathy is, especially today with everything that, that's going on and that people are going through. Managers and leaders need to, ha to have empathy. And if you don't, if you're not a naturally empathetic person, um, you should take heart because that's a skill that can be learned. Um, there are plenty of books, there are courses, there are people that can coach you to be more empathetic. And I think that that is, that's, that's what gets you in the door to being a manager these days is being an empathetic human mm. and then making the, sh the shift from, okay, I was an excellent individual contributor. I was really good at my tasks right. to, okay, now I need to get results through other people and, and, and help motivate other folks to perform at a high level while also taking care of them or encouraging them to take care of themselves. That that jump is too, I made that jump while I was at Microsoft and it is not an easy jump, right? That that jump is a quintessential shift when you go from individual contributor to like learning how to manage and not everybody makes it through that transition. And so again, I know your training is really trying to make more and more people successful there with that. So I think the other part I wanna add on here too, Eric, is that, you know, the, the bots, I think, I hope, my hope, my wish is that the bots come in and help us run these meetings better. Like right now, there is a bot that someone's working on that will start to uh, give feedback from not only you, but a whole group of people on virtual and let you know how engaged are they? Uh, you know, what's their actual, like there's a mood level where they neutral, happy, sad, angry. And, you know, there's like, that would be useful for us as facilitators. If, is there a way that we can get data that we can't normally see, right? There's, there's a lot of data that we learn as, we just purely learn, but it would be cool to have some statistical data that would really help us. Like, did that story hit, right? Mm -hmm. There's like, mm -hmm. you can get data back, right? Like you, you could probably get head nods and other things. If that story hit, then, you know, there's a couple indicators I think I could get that would let me know that 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 was an effective story in that case. Mm -hmm. So, okay, speaking of story, where people wanna come find you, where are they gonna come, come find you at, Eric? Probably the easiest thing is my website, gerardtrainingsolutions.com, and uh, Gerard is spelled with a G-I, not a G-E. <laughs> also, I'm all over LinkedIn, so look me up on LinkedIn. Um, I post content there three times a week, plus I've got newsletters and uh, a blog. Uh, so please, please come check me out. Excellent. Thanks so much, Eric. And the closing question is if, if somebody just listened to this whole interview, what's the one thing you want them to remember? Be the reason somebody smiles today. Be kind. Aww. Yep. Thank you so much for that. And Eric, I got to tell you, when I got a chance to visit you and your amazing family, it made me and Donna smile. So I want to say thank you for that. And thanks for uh, hanging out on this interview today. Thank you. All right, this is John Chen. We've been talking with Eric Gerard from Gerard Training Solutions, right? 
what are you going to do that's going to make someone smile today? I hope it's like one of the things like, hey, say thank you and a smile, right? Uh, tell somebody that you really like them or whatever it is. So uh, think about that as you complete this interview here with Eric Girard from Girard Training Solutions. Thank you so much and we'll see you next time. Don't we start people and keep going.